side, thanks for joining us. You're listening to the Health Essentials Podcast brought to you by Cleveland Clinic. My name is Cassandra Holloway, and I'll be your host for this episode. Today, we're broadcasting virtually as we are practicing social distancing guidelines during the coronavirus pandemic. We're joined virtually by Dr. Patrick Byrne. Dr. Byrne, thanks for taking the time to speak with us, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So if you take a look at any social media site, you'll likely notice filtered and edited pictures of those people you follow. Things like filters, Photoshop, and Facetune have made it easy to stage the quote, perfect selfie. Unfortunately, many people don't realize how much editing is often done behind the scenes of what we see posted on these social media sites. Then when we go to post our own selfie or our own picture, or even appear on a Zoom call, we can be shocked and disappointed by the fact that we don't look nearly as glamorous or as perfect as what we see posted on social media. And to some people, this can be a huge source of anxiety and even shame. Today, we'll be talking with Dr. Byrne about how filters and edited photos have amplified a condition called body dysmorphic disorder and how this has affected the cosmetic surgery industry. We'll talk about setting realistic and reasonable expectations and how you can love yourself and your selfies without filters. Before we dive into this full episode, we just wanna take a moment and remind listeners that this is for informational purposes only and is not intended to replace your own doctor's advice. Also, this interview was pre-recorded and does not reflect any changes to COVID-19 precautions that may have been made after the recording. So Dr. Byrne, I wanna first start off by asking if you'll tell us a little bit about your practice at Cleveland Clinic and the types of patients you see. I'm the chairman of the Head and Neck Institute and my specialty is facial plastic and reconstructive surgery. So my clinical practice is a mix. Uh, About half of the patients I see are uh, reconstructive surgery patients, a real emphasis on microsurgical uh, facial reconstruction, uh, particularly facial paralysis treatment. Uh, And then the other half is cosmetic surgery. And these are um, patients who desire to change their nose or their face, their neck in different ways to to look more youthful or attractive. So I wanna jump right into kind of the the main topic of this podcast. Can you start off by explaining to the listeners what is body dysmorphic disorder? Yeah, body dysmorphic disorder is a really tragic um, psychological condition. Uh, We tend to see it a lot in as clinicians who perform cosmetic surgery because patients with this condition are overrepresented in our practices by some of our own estimates, maybe as high as 13% of of the patients we see. And it's really characterized by an overwhelming concern for one or more uh, physical flaws. Uh, These patients tend to focus on their skin, their hair, and their nose especially. Uh, but it can be other areas. And amongst the key uh, features that lead to a a formal diagnosis uh, include that the the degree to which the concern about the flaw, be it real or imagined, affects the the patient. So very often these are people who uh, won't leave the house, have trouble maintaining a job. Um, it, It correlates very strongly with depression and uh, substance abuse. Uh, And so it's a really, really difficult uh, condition and these patients do suffer a lot. So there is a clear difference then between this disorder and then the traditional person who kind of, you know, sees a picture of themselves and they kind of say, oh my gosh, I don't like that. And because I feel like that's more normal, but there is a big difference or kind of a, a line that crosses over from this truly being something that's affecting your whole life, like you're saying, trouble keeping a job, not leaving the house versus just having those normal kind of everyday thoughts that on social media about, oh, I just, I don't like how I look in this picture. I totally agree. And, you know, as someone who specializes in this field, I think there is a spectrum. I think any one of us, uh, every human is prone to uh, developing concerns about a, a change in their appearance or Um, having certain features that they feel, you know, they wish they could change or improve. Uh, And that's super common. Uh, But, you know, as you progress through uh, from sort of a a typical concern about wishing you could look a little better, all the way to the extreme end of body dysmorphic disorder, there's a lot of shades of gray in between. And uh, what's unique now is that we're on the heels of over a decade 
in which uh, really for the first time in human history, young people in particular are carrying around all day long devices with which they take photographs and share photographs. And so the obsession with one's appearance as it, uh, as it appears on a, a screen uh, has fundamentally changed the way uh, we interact with patients and the kind of challenges that, that they bring to our attention. Are there any personality traits that make someone more prone to where they fall on that spectrum that you were talking about versus just kind of being upset about how you look in a picture all the way up to this being a full blown disorder? Like what are the personality traits of, of, it, of it being on the, the more serious side of the spectrum? Yeah, there are personality traits that we tend to see in these patients. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist myself. I'm a facial plastic surgeon, but um, you know, it, it it tends to be more common in people who uh, have obsessive traits. For one thing, uh, some studies have shown that the the mechanism by which uh, visual information is processed in these patients differs from the average population. In other words. Um, these are people, and this fits with clinical experience uh, for sure. Uh, these are people who tend to focus on very fine details of their appearance uh, rather than sort of the global uh, uh, visual picture. Um, it, you know, it, it strongly, as I said, correlates with depression as well. Uh, so a lot of these patients, that what we see in clinic is they, they're individuals who tend to be very, very self-critical, um, have quite a bit of insecurities about how they look. Uh, hypercritical about small details of their facial appearance, uh, and they and they catastrophize a bit. So they tend to interpret uh, other people's uh, facial expressions, for example, as being critical. They they tend to believe that other people are staring and and even making fun of them behind their back. And and it you know it's tricky because again everybody can feel these things sometimes. So. The traits that we see in body, dysmor body dysmorphic disorder, BDD, we, we do see elements of this in lots of patients who don't have uh, this condition. And I think as surgeons and other physicians and practitioners who are in this field, we really need to be very conscious of these maladaptive traits uh, because it, it provides opportunities for us to help set realistic expectations and oftentimes to, to encourage people not to go forward with procedures, actually. Sure. So as a facial plastic and reconstructive surgeon, how have you noticed, you know, these photo editing and filters affecting a patient's body image or self-esteem? Like how often do you see patients coming in comparing themselves to a filtered version of themselves? Oh, th this is actually pretty common. So there's uh, sort of two um, anecdotes I would share. The first is that even before the advent of these filters, which can really optimize the appearance and sometimes make them look rather cartoonishly perfect, um, even before that, we saw this shift in which uh, patients will come in. And just as I had in the first 10 years of my practice, you know, we, you know, I would ask them, you know, show me what you don't like about your face or show me what you'd like to improve. And typically we either have an image on our own uh, screen in the room with their image or, or we hand them a mirror, you know, and often we just hand them a mirror. And what was unique after the introduction of the smartphone is that uh, on a weekly basis, we started to encounter patients who would look in the mirror and, and in front of us uh, in the room would express things like, well, you can't really see it here, or I can't really, oh, it's not really showing up. And they instinctively reach in their pocket, pull out their phone, and they start showing how their nose is too big and it's crooked and you know they want this changed. And it's really a phenomenal uh, dynamic. I mean, it, it's obviously a little uh, deranged you know, to suggest that an, a, image on your phone is more reflective reality than, than the actual physical you <laughs> sitting in the room, you know? And so it, it's a really difficult dynamic. And part of that is because selfies distort facial um, proportions. So it's been shown that if selfie is taken pretty close to the face, for example, the nose looks about 30% larger than it actually is. And so even before these filters were in place, there's this, um, effect on many, many, many people 
in which they believe that they look worse than they actually do and they care more because they're subjected to their imagery literally thousands of times a year through social media platforms. And so that's been building for a long time. And then you add on this more recent dynamic of these filters, which can take those images that are driving a lot of uh, self-concern and anxiety that, gosh, I don't like the way I look. And then you can just magically fix it, you know, with the swipe of, a, of your finger on the screen. Uh, and we do see those patients. I've had some patients come in. Um, uh, the most extreme example was a patient who uh, brought in a printed image of an, an anime character, actually, and um, literally asked if I could somehow help her look like this anime character with these, you know, cartoonishly large eyes and small features. Um, and that's an extreme example, but uh, it, it really is um, unhealthy, I would say, especially for young people who are, you know, still developing their self-esteem. It's, it's an unfortunate dynamic, all of these things. Absolutely. So, you know, with that example of, of a patient coming in and wanting to resemble that anime character, it kind of walk me through what psychological kind of factors are addressed, or are there any assessments that patients go through when seeking cosmetic surgery? You, we've, we've been working on that. So um, in my previous position at Johns Hopkins, my colleague, Lisa Ishii, and her group worked with all of us to explore uh, practical ways that in the office setting, we could screen for body dysmorphic disorder in particular. And, you know, there's a criterion standard for the field, which is a structured interview process, which really is sort of the standard way of diagnosing uh, this condition, but it's very, very lengthy. And, um, you know, it's, it's highly impractical to administer in, in a, you know, busy surgical practice setting. So there is a very short questionnaire, less than 10 uh, questions that um, a body dysmorphic sort of um, survey uh, that we tested and found it to have very high sensitivity and specificity to screen for patients who ultimately then proved to um, test positive for body dysmorphic disorder. So this is relatively new, just in the last couple of years, we've been looking at this. Um, I'm a strong advocate for it though. I think we should uh, not only educate providers, but uh, standardize, standardize this into our workflows to try to identify these uh, people because there's two key reasons why it's, it matters. One is uh, in this, one of the studies we performed, uh, we found that clinicians aren't very good at identifying based on their own, their own intuition, which patients actually meet criteria for BDD. Um, and then the second thing is that performing surgery or other treatments on these patients doesn't help them. Um, at, at the most 20% of the time, uh, patients with uh, BDD will uh, say that the procedures they underwent were, were helpful. Uh, I can tell you my own clinical practice over the years, um, I think the answer is far, far less. So if I have a strong suspicion, of course, I'll never operate on someone, even when they have real deformities, actually, because they're not equipped to, uh, to experience the benefits, the psychological benefits from the intervention. Uh, and they need to be helped in other ways. So the American Society of Plastic Surgeons says that non-invasive procedures have tripled between the years 2000 and 2018. And I find that really interesting. Um, so wanting to change your body doesn't necessarily mean having surgery anymore. Um, instead, it can be these smaller touch-ups and these non-invasive procedures like Botox and derma fillers and lip injections. I feel like that's a big one we're seeing on social media. Have you seen a similar shift in your practice with more people seeking non-invasive procedures these days? Yeah, there's no doubt that goes back a few years. And I think that's um, multiple factors at play. So one is, again, people are progressively in our society more image obsessed. And I think that the um, progression of social media algorithms drives some of that. Uh, I would say that's not a positive thing, you know, as a, as a, not only as a surgeon, but as a parent. Um, there is some positive in it, though, which is that the options, uh, the non-invasive options to help people look more youthful and attractive are expanding all the time. And so there are a new array of um, non-invasive laser treatments, uh, fillers, neurotoxins, the skills with which uh, and the, the techniques we use to, to use them keep evolving and getting better and better, uh, more natural, for example. 
Um, so there's a lot of options that have uh, arisen, but there's also some element of demand that I think is as unfortunate. And of course, that's been accelerated a bit by the pandemic. So, so you have that as a as a pretext for the pandemic. And now, people are isolated. They're spending a lot of time alone. Uh, they're on screens for virtual meetings for hours and hours a day, often with a pretty unfavorable viewing angle and poor lighting. And you know, we, we make these jokes about the Zoom neck and how you know people are worried about. And, and they do. They come into our office like, oh my gosh, I need a neck lift. And and you know, we ask like, you know, what prompted this? Like, I've been staring at my neck on Zoom all day, you know? And so, so there are a variety of factors at play that have driven this increase of non-invasive as well as invasive procedures. So do you think that there actually has been an increase due to the pandemic? Like this has been a side effect that you can say has happened because of, of COVID? Yeah, a lot of practices um, this past year found that uh, demand for elective aesthetic procedures was higher, actually, you know, and it was, I don't know that many of us would have predicted that, uh, but it, it, it really did play out that way across the country in a lot of practices. And um, again, it's probably in part that people have more time on their hands, uh, that there's, you know, alone and sort of those who are prone to scrutinizing their own facial appearance are doing so more frequently. They're also looking at themselves more frequently in virtual meeting platforms. Uh, but there is this other element, which is kind of interesting, which is, uh, for example, when we do facial procedures like rhinoplasty, which is where we um, change the shape of the nose, typically there's a, a week or two period where patients are often self-conscious because the nose is swollen. And now, not only because of uh, you know virtual school from home and work from home, but also that people are wearing masks, that one of the barriers to undergoing the procedure has been lessened. People will frequently volunteer in clinic that well, I don't really care about taking time off or if I'm swollen, I'm wearing a mask all the time anyway. So it's really just been such an interesting year in this, in this field because of all these factors. I imagine in people who are vulnerable to this disorder, you kind of mentioned it earlier, generations that are now growing up always connected to social media. I think I'm really lucky. I'm a millennial and I grew up kind of with Facebook, but I was able to check it on my desktop. It, I wasn't always super connected all the time. And I think that was like the best of both worlds. But I feel like these younger generations who are always on social media, always connected, it can be really dangerous. And you kind of hinted at that earlier in our discussion. I'm, I'm wondering as a parent, like you mentioned, or to someone listening to this podcast who might be struggling with their self-image or borderline toward this disorder, um, how, how do they keep in mind about what's realistic and what's not? <clears throat> it's such a good question, you know, and this is a topic, you know, I've been in practice as a facial plastic surgeon for almost two decades. And, you know, I've been a parent of four kids now for a, about a decade. Um, and uh, it, it's a, a topic I think a lot about. I would say, uh, first of all, um, I personally, you know, if we sort of veer into parenting strategies, I'm very, very, very restrictive with my kids' um, screen time. Uh, don't allow any internet access, at, you know, just at the age of 12, the first phone was allowed with any kid, but no web, no internet access, no, none at all. Um, so a lot of, lot, very restrictive and, and they think I'm crazy. My, my kids, you know, they think I'm nuts. Um, and I tell them when you go to college, you can do what you want to do, but not now. Um, with people out there, you know, so for a lot of teenagers and beyond, that horse has left the barn. You know, they, they've already had years and years and years of be becoming accustomed to communicating with friends and um, via social media applications and kind of um, viewing and experiencing the world through these uh, media. Um, you know, there's a lot written about it, and I encourage people to look into the the what's out there, especially the work of Tristan Harris, who I'm really a fan of. Uh, but specific to facial appearance, you know, there's some real basic uh, truths that, as a facial plastic surgeon, I spend a lot of times talking to my patients about. The first is that really every single face has imperfections. And what I mean is uh, areas of the face that deviate from the aesthetic ideal. We actually have a pretty good sense of what people find attractive in male faces and female faces. And, and it's quite uh, consistent. There's a lot of fidelity across different age groups, across different ethnic backgrounds about the kind of features that 
people find attractive. Um, and it's specific to ethnicity, uh, and but it's consistent within groups, you know. And <clears throat> what you find is that uh, our what it turns out our brains are not very good actually in most cases to identify the details. And so if we go back to early in the conversation where we found that BDD patients tend to process visual information differently, they, they um, scrutinize spine details, whereas most of us don't. It really is the case that there are imperfections on every face we encounter that we don't even see. It's right in front of us. And so I will, you know, go through a lot of time with my patients, uh, kind of explaining and walking through in detail all of the imperfections and asymmetries of my own face and the nurse in the room and the husband or wife of the patient. And, and it's really an introduction to a form of cognitive behavioral therapy, which, you know, CBT is probably the most outside of some medications, like um, specifically serotonin reuptake inhibitors. CBT is a, is a proven mechanism to benefit body dysmorphic patients as well as patients with depression. Uh, so I've become a huge fan of a lot of my reconstructive surgery patients, which is a big part of my practice, to help them realize that they can integrate in society with confidence in part because that despite their worries, in general, other people aren't going to be scrutinizing their facial details to the degree that they are. So it's a bit of a, it's a mind shift that takes practice to uh, and habitual thought patterns that we try to um, help people change over time. I'm curious how you were talking about when you, you sit with a patient in your office and you kind of educate them and kind of go through that discussion about their thought process for wanting these procedures done. Does the, I'm sure you're familiar with TikTok and uh, there's the inverted filter that keeps coming up where your, your face is flipped. So you actually are viewing yourself as how other people view you versus kind of what you typically see in the mirror. And I feel like a lot of people are kind of losing their minds over that. I'm just curious, have you had any experience with patients coming in kind of um, seeking help for, for that type of, of thought process? Well, we see a similar dynamic frequently because we'll have patients who are convinced of a problem. You know, <clears throat> one pretty common example might be, well, my, my nose is twisted or my nose is asymmetric. And when we pull up their own high def professional studio imagery that we've taken in the office onto the screen in the room, um, there's a percentage of patients who get very thrown off because they can't remember or understand which side was the problem. So they can look at you know, selfies in which their nose is um, exaggerated in its size and asymmetry. And it's of course, not the version they're used to looking at. And then, and then they see sort of an accurate version on the screen and they, and they forget and they can't even tell us you know, what the problem is. So um, there's a number of ways in which these technologies introduce cognitive distortions of this type. Uh, and you know, it really is tricky because that, there was years ago where I was treating a, a rabbi, an elderly patient, wonderful guy. And I was explaining to him, you know, he's, he's wondering, you think if people are gonna notice this, you know, it was a skin cancer on his nose that we repaired. And, and I said, no, oh, probably not. You know, and I was explaining to him some of the, you know, stuff we've been talking about today, which is, you know, other people really don't pay attention to details and long as it's close enough, you know, our brains tend to fill in the rest. And he, he rattled off a, a old uh, Hebrew phrase, uh, which he then translated for me. And he said, oh yeah, you know, it means the only face one never sees is one's own. And it struck me as such a powerful statement because it's factually true that on planet earth, the only face you can never see is your own face. So you, we know what other people look like. We, no one really knows what our, oneself looks like. And when you think about the, you know, the goals of facial plastic surgery, which is often to produce a change that the patient perceives to be sufficient such that they achieve a psychological benefit worth the risk, you know, it's a very um, hard to pin down outcome, very different from most fields. You know, most of our colleagues at Cleveland Clinic will, will have outcomes measures of surgeons like a biopsy result or 
They'll have physiologic measures, which are objective, measure the blood pressure. And, um, you know, our field lacks that precision um, because it's all a perceptual and psychological state change that we're trying to engineer, um, which means, as you can imagine, it makes it somewhat complicated. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's like if you have a broken bone, you can heal the broken bone. But how do you kind of sort through kind of what everything we've been talking about today with kind of your thought process and, and how you process what you're seeing on social media? Super hard. You know, it, we'll have patients in the room and the loved one will be there and the loved one will sometimes be saying, I think she looks fine. I don't even notice, you know, and then the patient will say, oh, she's just saying that to make me feel better because she's my mom. And, you know, I kind of see both sides as an expert in the field and I can say, well, you're, you're both right. You know, there, there actually is a deformity, you know, we can quantify it and describe it. And your mom's probably right that nobody else sees it. Um, and, and so there's a lot of uh, judgment and art in patient uh, selection, but uh, coaching, a lot of coaching, I think is important for us in this field. And like you said, we should remember selfies can make your nose look 30% bigger, which is shocking to me and good to think about too, especially when you're, when you're picking yourself apart or you see something just kind of to remember, um, just to put it in perspective a little bit. Oh, I have this great screen. I show it to all patients now. It has two images. It's the same girl, a lovely, maybe, you know, 15 year old girl. And one image is taken with a professional camera and the other is with a smartphone. In this case, the difference is really the focal length uh, of, the, of the two uh, cameras. And the, the smartphone image, uh, the patient looks much, like a, her nose looks much larger. It looks more asymmetric. She looks more tired. Her face doesn't look as lovely. And the other one looks totally different. And they're taking the exact same distance, 10 seconds apart, same lighting. And you know it's really helpful to show patients this because they realize in an instant, gosh, I'm basing my own self-image on a medium that um, oftentimes tends to distort in a negative way my facial features. Um, so, you know, patients who are have a lot of self-confidence, they tend to cherry pick and remember all the images of themselves that look good. And they, they assume, well, that's how I look to the world. And many, uh, you know, patients and uh, uh, many of us have insecurities, of course, we're, we're human. And we tend to discard those images in our minds, data set that look good. And we, we, th we look at the bad ones like, oh my God, do I really look like that? Um, or you walk by a mirror and you think, oh my Lord, do I really look like that? And you know, it can feed on our insecurities. And, and you know, so as a, as a surgeon in this field, I, it's actually incredible how much time we spend talking about one's self image and, and taking these data sources with a grain of salt and um, maybe choose some more positive self-talk. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if, if you care about your patients, you're going to focus on that a lot. Sure. So the last thing I want to ask you about today is for your general advice. Uh, we've talked about this off and on. You brought up a good point with CBD um, and taking time away from social media. But I want to just ask for your parting advice for someone suffering from BDD or just from a low self-esteem level. Um, what would be your advice to him or her about keeping things in perspective, especially if they're considering cosmetic surgery or they're just very upset about how they appear on social media, kind of what would be your parting advice to listeners? Well, if for anyone out there who has a, a feature, say a facial feature that they're frustrated by, they, they really would like it addressed, they're even considering undergoing some sort of cosmetic procedure. Um, I'd say, first of all, that it's totally fine. It's natural uh, to desire. It's very biological, actually. It's not really just vanity. We have a biological um, drive to value our facial appearance. And so it's totally natural. Um, I would say um, do so w with some acceptance and sort of um, of your own self. In other words, realize, I, I hope you'll realize that um, if you're like most human beings, you, you probably think you look much worse than you actually do. That's just the way it goes. And so you could be on one end of the spectrum, very healthy, well-adjusted, you, you know, you want your nose improved. And that tends to be a fairly simple experience for people often. 
Uh, and the other end of the spectrum is someone with a real diagnosable psychiatric condition, such as body dysmorphic disorder, in which there is no imperfection and it's very fabricated. And, and it can be even delusional, um, frankly delusional. Um, but there's a lot of people in between, you know, and it's a spectrum. And I think for everybody in between, I'd say, you know, uh, acknowledge that um, you, you probably are more critical of yourself than anybody else's. Um, spend some time acknowledging the truth that improving your facial appearance, even when a successful operation is performed, doesn't solve all of life's problems. It can certainly help with your self-image, uh, but you're, you know, it's the same person and, and it's all the other stuff going on in your life that's gonna ultimately determine how happy you are. Uh, and try to do so with a partner of someone who actually cares about you. So a parent, a loved one, um, don't go through it alone, even the decision-making process. And listen, listen to others for their advice if they have your best interest in mind. I guess that would be my, my shortest advice I can, I can think of. Absolutely. Wonderful advice to end on. Dr. Byrne, thank you so much. You've been fascinating to speak with and sharing your insight with all of us. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. For the latest news about facial plastic surgery, visit clevelandclinic.org slash facial plastic surgery. If you want to listen to more Health Essentials podcasts featuring experts like Dr. Byrne, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from or visit clevelandclinic.org slash HE podcasts. Also, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Cleveland Clinic, all one word, to stay up to date on the latest health news and information. Thanks for listening.